to get right to the point. I bring you greetings from the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Illinois and Wisconsin, where your regional minister and president is the Reverend Dr. Teresa Dolgay Parker, and your 138, 39 sister congregations. It fluctuates depending on the month, who's <laughs> mad at us and who's glad at us. <laughs> but I bring you greetings and just want to, because I will not be with you next weekend, um, let you know how proud I am of you. And this sermon is, is written especially for you, but I want to let you know how proud I am with you because a lot of this journey, not all 50 years of it, but a lot of this journey over the last 15, I've walked with you. And so I want you to know that I am pleased that we're all still standing. Amen. Amen. <laughs> um, an unrestricted momentum. Why would I choose to talk about an unrestricted momentum? Number one, because God is searching for congregations, leaders, members, those who will not be quiet. Those who will move forward throughout this life and this lifetime, sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus to everyone who will listen. And to not feel restricted, prohibited, banned, or stopped from moving out in this mission. Number two, the times in which we live are evident. We do not need to go down the Rolodex of tragic, tragedies and travesties. The times in which we live, they're evident. We see it right before our eyes. And in the midst of a restricted momentum, LeBron James <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> King James <laughs> returned back to his and my hometown, Cleveland. <laughs> so let's see how this is going to go. <laughs> Yet we are in the throes of turbulence, and those, meaning the church, God's ambassadors on earth, must continue doing our job. Yes, the world, this state, this city, um, this country is filled with many restrictions, but they cannot restrict God. God cannot and will not be restricted. A good day, thank you. I didn't have to ask for it. It was right there. <laughs> Once God's momentum has begun in us, God who has begun a good work in us is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. We are unlimited and we are unstoppable. Let's yeah. pray. Great God, we give you thanks this morning because you are a great God. And we thank you for what you <coughs> are doing in the life of First Christian Church in Downers Grove. Give us an ear to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive your word today. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Is this my water? Yeah. Yes. I was going to say, if not, I'm still going to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> Next Sunday is the big day for you. 50 years. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. 50 years of prayers and hopes and dreams and disappointments and fears and standing and sitting and loss. 50 years of not only being lost but being found, remodeling and redirecting, reframing and reframing. <laughs> Hold me back, somebody. <laughs> today because I want you to go home and I want Sue to finish up those center page pieces and I want you to get your rest, the needed rest that you need to get back here next Sunday and welcome all your guests and to stay all day long. <laughs> but I certainly want to address you and how fitting it is for me to address you this Sunday. <laughs> 
<clears throat> the week before the party, the week before the punch, I sort of feel like your mother. <laughs> okay, well, maybe not your mother. Uh, but yes, a very young aunt. <laughs> yes. Because I sat at tables with you, many of you, and we have cried together. And I have shaken my head at some of you and said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. But we lived through it all. We lived through it all. And so this morning, I want to talk about an unrestricted momentum. Many of you know me, and you know me well. I am one of the rule breakers. I'm a boundary pusher, one who would be willing to, in the words of my mother, press my luck. <laughs> yes, that's me. It's me because I learned early on that the silent one doesn't get hurt. A closed mouth doesn't get fed. And last but least, you get sloppy seconds. And I'm nobody's sloppy seconds. You know the jargon and the cliches people use. Those who remain hungry and passionate, yet it's silent witness to things that you and I don't get to hear seem to stifle us or move us to a place of dissatisfaction. And at times we are moved if you fail to speak up or if you fail to show some time, you are oftentimes moved to a place of being voiceless. Can you imagine me and Sue, Hazinga, being voiceless? Amen. Can you imagine us without a voice? Can you imagine us quieted without anything to say? Well, that's not what the sermon is about, of course. It's about not for one minute thinking you and I have it all made. Sometimes when you reach the peak or the pinnacle of something, you say that's all we have to do. We can just kick back and relax and slide on down the rest of the way. 50 years is a good age. But don't you know 50 is the new 30? <laughs> so there's no sliding back, kicking back, waiting to be served. Yes, oh yes, God has brought us all from a mighty long way. Many of us are not where we began in our spiritualities or since coming to this church. Some of us walked through the doors of this church and we weren't where we are today spiritually. We have grown, we have matured, and we have dealt with some of the strong questions that we've been faced with. Many have been faced with fear and debt and death and hostility and sometimes shame and guilt. But we've grown. We're not where we used to be, but praise God, we're not where we're going to be. Amen. We're not where we're going to be. Amen. <laughs> Let's stop and take just a brief second to think about the fact that we're not where we're going to be, that God has more for us. That's what this sermon is about. It's about not yet being where you're destined to be. There's so much more, and it just keeps getting bigger and better. In this morning's passage of scripture, I'm happy for us to look at the Apostle Paul as he addresses the church at Thessalonica, and I address you. Paul is mentoring and mentioning some very important virtues. He's offering the church the spiritual characteristics needed as they continue walking in strength and power, in vision, and in victory. Thessalonica was known for being a city that loved God. Much like you. You love God. Thessalonica was named after Alexander's half-sister, and at that time, being under Alexander's regime. 
So they had a lot of things that they had to overcome, a lot of things that they had to forfeit, a lot of the patriarchy and a lot of the worshiping of false idols. But yet, the Apostle Paul came on the scene. And you know what it's like when the Apostle Paul comes on the scene. Although he may be a prisoner, he takes no prisoners. Paul is coming to the church at a time when they had become a place that understood that their strength and their momentum lie in God. Paul spoke with them with passion. Paul spoke with them with promise. Paul spoke with them with the ability to move them from one place to the next. And in his ability to speak to them, he pushed them and he strengthened and he jump-started their momentum. Paul encourages the church to continue in prayer, continue in having the faith needed to stand firm in who they were and what they knew God to be. Secondly, Paul invited them to work hard for the sake of the gospel and for those needing to hear it. He said to them, their faith involves and it needs to work, a strong work, and virtue always includes the choices we make to do everything covered in God's grace. God's grace. Some would say God's unmerited favor. I choose to say God's ability to look beyond our faults to see our needs. Paul also encouraged them to work as a labor of love. How many of you have done things as a labor of love? You don't have to raise your hand, because usually when you do things as a labor of love, you really don't want to do it. <laughs> so as you get it down, <laughs> you say, this is my labor of love. <laughs> he goes on to tell them that persistence, that there is persistence in hope, and that their persistence in God, and in the faith and in the work that they do is not in vain. Especially since it's Jesus who empowers them, the Holy Spirit that motivates them, and God who gives them everything that they need to soar. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a season when we must soar. Not just fly, not just fly, but soar. Yes, Paul was not only with the church of Thessalonica for a short period of time. But Paul had been kicked out of better places. As you do research in Paul, Paul was always sneaking in and being smuggled out of countries. And research said that he was in Thessalonica for three straight weeks. He preached in the synagogue three straight weeks about this Jesus and about this strength and about this power. He preached with vigor and consistency, never losing his momentum. And that's why I'm saying it's time for us to soar, because when we soar, we must not lose momentum. If you do, you very well may fall. First Christian Church, 50 years of worship, 50 years of hospitality, 50 years of love and excitement, what more do you have? A lot. That's right. I'm calling you out. <laughs> On Facebook, they call people out for different things. I won't tell you the latest thing that they've been calling people out for. But they call you out and they challenge you to do things. I'm calling you out. What more do you have? in there. Do you have any more dinners and teas and backpacks? Can you find any more special events? How much more love and hospitality and grace do you have? I will tell you when I came today it was slipping because every time that I've come over the last 15 years somebody's been there to give me my bulletin. <laughs> but I won't hold that against you. <laughs> How much more do you have? Well, I believe that you have found your niche. I believe that you have a rhythm. 
I believe that you have built this rhythm upon the syncopation of God's notes. The Holy Spirit will assure you not to lose or miss a beat. To me, I believe that after 50 years, we must keep on moving, don't stop. We must keep pushing and keep worshiping and keep reaching out and keep giving backpacks and keep having dinners and parties and celebration. Most importantly, you must keep on giving away the gospel. Keep giving it away to those who want it, those who need it, and to those who have yet to recognize that there is a need for the gospel of Jesus to reign and to rule over their lives. Amen.
according to Charles Dick Dickens, we are living in the best of times and in the worst of times. And I believe that you, First Christian Church, you have everything needed to supply those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. The momentum is here. It is boundaryless to me. It is not prohibited. You are free. You are free to move. You are free to grow. You are free to expand. You're not restricted. You are not silenced. You are not the voiceless. You're not the voiceless and you cannot be quieted. Because Jesus is your Savior, Terry is your leader, and the Holy Spirit is your God. So if I'm going to be here next week, I would say something to you like this. Move in faith, and you'll see what you've never seen before. You'll go where you've never been before, and you'll do what you've never, ever, ever seen any other church do before. That's what I would say to you. But since I am here, I want you to do something with me so that I can have this vivid picture in my mind next week. It won't be a, the old retired ministers getting on their skateboards or bus, <laughs> but it'll, it'll be of you standing tall with me and raising your hands in the air as a symbol of being 50 and free. Raise your hands in the air, let me see you do it as a sign to say we're 50 and we're free. You can let it down. I know some of you are saying this is too tiring. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you are 50 and free. <laughs> and that you are not restricted, but you are on this path, on this journey. This unrestricted momentum. I'll end by telling this story. Last week was the 4th of July. And boy, was it the 4th of July. I ended up babysitting some other people's children. <laughs> and some of you who are my Facebook friends, you understood that I was at Great America. <coughs> um, on my list of 1 through 50, it's probably like number 52. <laughs> the places where I'd like to be in life. And I was with a six-year-old. and. He is reading on a third grade level. But I didn't think that his reading skills would come into play last week. <laughs> so we're standing in line and he is, you know how children do. They, they take it in first. They observe first. Their wheels turn first. And he realized that the marks on the walls, which were different colors, were representative of his height. So he went, as I was dealing with the woman at the ticket booth, around measuring which height he was. So he walks over to the yellow stripe, which is 50 inches and above. So he measured himself at 50 inches, and then he walked over to the wall and picked up the yellow slip that correlated with the yellow mark. And he was reading all of the rides that he could now <laughs> the rides in which he was eligible for. And he came over to me and he said, I'm eligible for the demon. I'm eligible for the viper. And I'm re eligible for the raging bull. And in my head, I was thinking, how will I talk him out of this? I could see the beads of sweat forming around his he says, but I think we'll try the dark night first. So we got through that one, and he says, well, I'm never going to write that again. And I thought, that's wonderful. <laughs> but then we moved into the area where the viper was, and he says, I need to ride the viper. And my, his 11-year-old brother and I tried desperately to talk him out of the viper. <laughs> Not because he was afraid, but because I was afraid. <laughs> so we make it up to the platform, and we're letting people go past us because I'm trying to talk him out of the viper. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, just like Murphy's Law, a whole gang of children, probably around his age, came up to the platform and then took their seats. That put fuel on the fire. <laughs> we get on this viper. And I lock him in, I lock myself in, and I'm sitting there, and I began to quote the Lord's Prayer. Because <laughs> they show you a picture where you need to keep your head back so it won't go from side to side. And I thought, any ride that will show you a picture telling you to keep your head back, I'm going to return necklace. <laughs> necklace. 
in the car. But we started at a very slow and steady pace. And the Viper is a very old roller coaster, and it's wooden, so you can hear the <laughs> <laughs> And as we began to move slowly up the hill, all was well in our little car until we got to the very top, and then we took off as fast as the speed of lightning. There was no turning back for us, church. <laughs> waiting, willing, and ready to receive 